There we go. Okay, so our theme we're exploring uh, in this responsive meditation training for this week is anger and compassion. Last week we explored what is the embodied heart. This feels like a nice little a next step uh, that's connected to that as one exploration of the embodied heart. And so compassion is often a, a focal point of practice um, of meta, of heartfulness in the Buddhist tradition. Compassion is one of the four immeasurables, uh, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And along with compassion or any of these four measurables, you're automatically going to be discussing and exploring anger as well. So we're going to talk about anger a little bit today. And also anger just feels up for so many of us uh, in different ways for different reasons, um, individually, collectively. So it could be very useful to just explore that openly uh, in our practice. Um, but first, the talk. I just want to talk a little bit. What what is compassion as it's framed in the Buddhist tradition classically? And a, a great book that I usually reference quite a lot is this book, The Four Measurables, from B. Allen Wallace. So many teachings and books on the Four Measurables, so you're never going to run out of resources there. But this is a nice one. It's a nice overview, and it's going to be a little bit more flavored towards the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. But overall, it's pretty straightforward and neutral. Um, so compassion can be summarized a variety of ways, but it's, you know, essentially the wish for all beings to be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. And it's, it's a wish, it's an intention, and it's also a response that we wish that so much for ourselves and all beings that we're moved, we're moved to, to respond and take action. We want to contribute to the lessening and removal of suffering wherever we can. So in this kind of a practice, there are many different forms of compassion practice, but classically working with a phrase like, may I be free of suffering, may you be free of suffering, may we all be free of suffering. And there's variations on that phrase, but that's essentially it. And we can work with that phrase just by sitting, dropping into our experience and working with that phrase and seeing what happens, see what gets stirred up, see what moves. And this, this wish, it goes even a little further where it's not just somebody else's suffering when we're cultivating it for all beings. It, it, we feel it so much that it feels like our suffering, that there's not a difference. I mean, there is a difference, you know, we can recognize that in a rational sort of way, um, but it, it becomes so strong that that wish to alleviate suffering that it feels like our own, that we have to do something about it. And along with anger, I think a lot of us are feeling that as well, that response to suffering, our own and others, and uh, a strong desire for that to be relieved. And it is important for me anyways to note, make a distinction here first of um, that wish and intention versus the strategies that I or we might take up in order to respond and enact a compassionate response, you know, to alleviate that suffering. I, I distinguish that simply because I can sit here at least and ha cultivate that wish. That's one thing I can do right now is to stoke that flame of compassion within. And even the responses I have, some of them may work out, some of them may not work out, right? But we can keep trying. So that for me is important because if the strategies we're using together, you know, to respond to suffering aren't quite working, it doesn't mean that we're still not seated in, in coming from that compassionate place. And it allows us to also question and wonder about our strategies because they're not glued to that intention. We can hold those lightly and, and be creative in our response. Um, now with compassion, so all the four measurables could be defined really, really simply like we've just done there. They also um, have near, what are called near and far enemies. And uh, I noticed today that sometimes there might be a little variation on that, depending on the tradition and who's teaching it. But it's useful. The, the idea here is to, okay, so we, we talk and, and we note what is compassion, but it's also helpful to say, what isn't compassion? 
like what's completely not compassion and then also what isn't compassion that seems like maybe it is but not really so that way we have more clarity in our practice so uh the near enemy of compassion and here's where today i found uh two um you'll either find pity as a near enemy um but the Alan loss he, he actually listed despair or grief which both make sense so again you might find different responses there. Pity is pretty common that you'll find. So uh, with despair or grief, uh, Alan Wallace described this as, um, I think I like the word despair a little bit more uh, here, but there's, there's a heaviness uh, to, to the feeling where rather than feeling intensely, intensely the that suffering and, and the heartbreak and the desire to respond all of a sudden our presence starts collapsing in on itself where it becomes harder like there's a, the, a black hole of sorts that that we that pulls us and it limits our response to suffering but it feel but we're feeling something really intensely related to the suffering so that's why you know if it seems similar but it's not the same thing as compassion as we're as defined in in Buddhist practice. So here we we definitely are cultivating a super intense often experience of suffering, of this empathetic suffering um, and wanting to do something about it, but not losing ourselves in it such that we uh, we can't respond. Now with pity, um, I have a quote here from Jack Cornfield that I thought was really good. Uh, the near enemy of compassion is pity. Instead of feeling the openness of compassion, again, the openness, Pity says, oh, that poor person, I feel sorry for people like that. Pity sees them as different from ourselves. It sets, sets us up a separation between ourselves and others, a sense of distance, of remoteness from the suffering of others that is affirming or gratifying to the self. Compassion, on the other hand, recognizes the suffering of another as a reflection of our own pain. I understand this. I suffer the same way. It is an empathetic a mutual connection with the pain and sorrow of life. Compassion is shared suffering. So again, the idea of openness, and again, we're not uh, minimizing how intense we feel that, but we are paying attention to the openness and also the sense of intimacy with that suffering. Uh, one time I gave a talk on this and the phrase that came up, anybody's familiar with parkouring? It's like where you jump off of surfaces to, to move. Like pity kind of is like parkouring a little bit. It's sort of like for my practice, like I want to cultivate compassion. So boom, there's a nice opportunity for me to experience suffering, but not enough that I want to cultivate it. It's like, thanks for the opportunity, but you know, compassion stays with it. Compassion's like, I'm going to be with this moment, this, this suffering and, and see what happens. Now, the far enemy, um, I sometimes it confuses me why they say one's near and far like the adjectives, but the far is a, uh, I guess it's far away from compassion, perhaps that's it, um, is cruelty, just plain and simple, like the uh, wanting people to suffer. Um, and uh, um, I mentioned this word before in one of the trainings that uh, German word Scheudenfreude, which I'm not pronouncing probably correctly, but it's that, you know, delight in the other people's suffering. And I know I experience that too. Sometimes it's like, a, it's like minimal, you know, it's like, uh, you know, especially for people who cause a lot of suffering and to see them, you know, fall on their ass a little bit or something. Part of me goes, hoo, 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 ha, ha, good for you. <laughs> but, you know, it's important to notice that because sometimes that turns into something more rather than like some lightly held response that's natural and human. It turns in, it starts turning in on itself. So cruelty makes sense. Like when we talk about this um, and it's kind of like a duh, of course, I, and I don't want to be cruel, but, you know, I 100% own oh, there is uh, one politician in particular that makes me feel this super intensely. And I acknowledge it. It's just right there in the core of me where I'm just like, oh, my gosh, I can my mind is going to explode. So ooh, it's a lot of practice <laughs> to not succumb to that, that, uh, that um, emotion. OK, so now. Um, Anger comes up too, because it's sort of like, where does anger fit in? And there's so much discussion about anger, especially in the Buddhist tradition. And I'm going to share some quotes from the Dalai Lama today, but I think, you know, it's interesting is I've known, and I actually, I looked at a few different books from the Dalai Lama and I've followed him for a long time as well. But sometimes he's talked about anger being like, it's bad. It's just like, nothing's good about it, period, end of story. 
However, he has another book where he was like, maybe not, you know, okay, maybe some anger is good. I think actually having this conversation and like actually just inviting ourselves into the inquiry, not even making assumptions up front, but just saying, okay, what is anger? How does it show up? What is it like? What is What are its qualities? What are the different qualities it can have? And what, what does that feel like to feel anger? And how does that impact how I'm showing up? And and as I'll, we'll, we'll look here in a minute, um, I'm going to show you some examples, even in the tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, where we see actually um, uh, enlightened forms of anger or embraced forms of anger. So it's not really, uh, anger is all bad. Um, and I think all this is really important because when we do this as Zen noting practice that we're going to do, do today, we're going to be saying as compassion, in other words, as I inhabit and become compassion, what do I notice? There is, hmm, there is as compassion, there is this. So here, this is kind of what we're trying to get inside of compassion. And so anger, sometimes we're inside of that and it relates to compassion. Okay, so there's so much already been said about anger that I feel like it's one of those assumed things that, you know, a certain destructive form of anger harms ourselves and others. And it can even turn, go further and become hatred, right? And which totally collapses attention and presence and, um, uh, hijacks our response. So, um, you know, an anger that seeks to harm is disruptive. That's the simplest way I would say it. So if I'm experiencing anger and pretty much the only purpose is to cause harm, it's not to, um, to liberate in some way, to help in some way, then that's a key distinction for me. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and also sometimes with anger can come self-righteousness and again, what's really interesting in talking about near and far enemies is that if we see some form of suffering and we know that it, this needs to be stopped, it needs to be removed, it needs to be liberated, um, and our response is anger, which can make a lot of sense. And then we got to see where does that anger go? Does it go towards, again, liberating towards protection, um, towards serving, or does it go towards harm and nothing more than that? So it get the, the initial seed of that anger turns into something else. And the reason why I like some of the practices we do here, like with embodiment or like the sin noting is it allows us to explore this a little bit because sometimes the traditions can make it pretty, like too simple, like anger, bad, compassion, good, now go. And, and you know, our, our, our lived experience is more nuanced and complex than that. We're moment to moment. It could be a mix even for me. So here, I think it's, I, I like cultivating the practice of just trying to pay attention and see what's going on in my, in my experience. And uh, so with this, there's no need to shame ourselves. Like this is like, well, it's just me look at anger and see what's going on. Like, even though I mentioned earlier that a politician that I shall not name in this moment although you'll see me name them in other contexts. I'm just being more neutral here. <laughs> that uh, I, I stay with that because it's like, if I just shut down the anger automatically, then I might shut down parts of me that, that really respond and take action. So I'm going to let it arise and see what I can do with it, see what can serve and what can liberate and what I need to let move through, okay? Now, there's some really great quotes here from the Dalai Lama in a, in a book uh, that's, uh, what is it called here when I put it at? Uh, Beyond Religion, Ethics for a Whole World. And in this book here, he seemed to express some other viewpoints on emotions like anger and attachment and desire more, more of a depends kind of response versus like a all or nothing. Hatred was in the all or nothing category. It's just never good, never, never serves. So, uh, and if you're not familiar with Dalai Lama's story, I mean, you can go read on the Tibetan, uh, you know, the experience of the Tibetan people experienced in, you know, what they experienced in, I think it was the 60s, 50s, 60s uh, in China and the so-called cultural revolution, which is a term that it sounds way too nice for what happened to their people. Um, so he, he very much has an experience of, of, receiving great harm to himself and people. So that's why a lot of times I like to hear what he has to say on some of these uh, subjects. 
So uh, one quote here, nothing in the principal compassion, the wish to see others relieved of suffering involves surrendering to the misdeeds of others. So I like that, that's number one. So com compassion doesn't mean tolerating or letting people do whatever the hell they wanna do, okay? Which means that we can take, a, we can have a stance and response. Um, and another quote, here the issue is how to deal with anger. There are two types of anger. One type arises out of compassion. That, that kind of anger is useful. Anger that is motivated by compassion or desire to correct social injustice and does not seek to harm the other person is a good anger that is worth having. I agree, personally. Um, and another quote, when faced with economic or any other kind of injustice, it is totally wrong for a religious person to remain indifferent. Religious people must struggle to solve these problems. So here, a call to action to, to do something. And then last, this has a longer quote here. Um, similarly, even anger is not always destructive. For example, in some situations, strong compassion may give rise to an equally strong sense of outrage that is anger about an injustice. Again, feeling anger can in the short term make our minds more focused and give us an extra burst of energy and determination. In these ways, angers can, in certain situations, make us more effective in getting things done and obtaining what we rightly seek. However, when anger extends beyond this practical function, most of the energy it brings, uh, it brings us is not helpful at all. Since all of us have probably at one more time or another been on the receiving end of other people's anger, we have all we all have the experience of its unpleasant consequences. Okay. So I think again, this topic can be pretty simple, but uh, in, in the in working within our own our experience can be a whole nother ballgame. But I like exploring those two angles in terms of is anger useful or not. Now I wanted to show um a few examples of compassion and also with what might be related to anger in the Tibetan tradition. And I'm gonna see if I can share my screen with you here while doing this. I'm not sure how this will show up in the recording. Um, okay, I'm gonna share this. Can you all see this? Okay, so this is Avalokiteshvara. It's one form of Avalokiteshvara in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, the Bodhisattva of compassion. And uh, it is a peaceful deity. That's the category of deity that this is. And I have that behind me actually, a tonka of this. And so this is like one flavor and form of compassion that's really well known. And here, you, there's so much symbology in Tibetan Buddhism, but uh, a couple of things are of note. One is the 11 heads that uh, Avalokiteshvara has, which are more heads to hear and see all the suffering of the world. Um, and then the uh, thousand arms in order to reach out and to respond. And even all of the arms have eyes, you know? So it's like this really intense motivated effort to, to see. And the, the story that uh, I, was, I was reading about how this came to be is uh, that Avalokiteshvara's heart was breaking so much that uh, Amit, Amitabha, uh, Amitabha uh, Buddha uh, gave these heads and arms. So it was like a heartbreak that said, please, I want to help, you know, and it was just this overwhelming heartbreak that led to, to this form. And the mantra that is really, really famous, one of the most famous mantras is Om Mani Padme Hum. And uh, it, it, mantras can be said in so many different ways, just repeating it, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum. And uh, it can be sung. So there's a really well-known uh, melody uh, with this. Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum. Okay, so it might've been not right on key, but something like that, you know, where it's really soft and lovely. This is one form, okay? It's a very soothing mantra to say as well. Okay, now I'm gonna see if I can, I'm gonna share a different one with you. We're gonna switch up the gears. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So now you see this one here. So this is, um, now we're getting into the category of wrathful deities. So completely different form and flavor of compassion and not just compassion, but a lot of different enlightened qualities or qualities we might cultivate in practice. So um, just real quick on wrathful deities. Um, 
the let me see i can't see the chats here i don't know if there's something oh, i don't know how to see the chat sorry <laughs> but uh, get, you can see everything is yes that's okay okay great um so they're fierce okay i love this the wrathfulness they're fierce and they're they're they mean business and there there's an action quality to them they're ready to 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 get some things done um often destroyer of obstacles and here like the image came up to me like in if you look up machinery like big excavators like construction equipment that are meant to like move dirt move uh buildings and things like that it's there's an there's a intense energy they're powerful they protect they aid beings transform negativity and harmful ways into um uh, wisdom and compassion and um a, a quote from Trungpa Rinpoche, wrathful yidams work more directly and forcefully with passion and aggression and delusion, conquering and trampling them on the spot. And these words fit conquering and trampling is very much like the words. So here, this is a chalan, a chalana or a chalanata and, is, uh, and in the category of five wisdom kings. Um, so uh, one of the, the few different names for, for him, this is from Shingong, Vajrayana in uh, Japan. Uh, immovable one, immovable mantra king, mantra king, or um, also be described as movable, immovable in fierce compassion. Like his compassion is so fierce that he, he's not moving. He's staying right here and ready to serve, ready to um, serve uh, practitioners and in the world. And you can even see like things like the flames, which have symbology. Many times wrathful deities will have flames around them, uh, burning away impediments, uh, obstacles and um, burning away the, the distinction between self and other. And um, one note here, this was from one of my mentors, Hokai Silva. I worked with this, uh, with a child in, nah, for a brief period of time. And uh, he noted, and this is, I think, just true in general, when acting with fierce compassion externally, you have to be empty on the inside, meaning open so like if that anger is really free of of that you know desire to harm or collapsing or like turning into an egoic event then it can you can be fierce but you just have to be clear <laughs> of what's going on in the in the fierceness and so here with the mantra which you can see this mantra online sometimes you know in, in tibetan buddhism there's a thing about like um receiving transmission and things like that before you're able to do a practice but you can see, hear many of these mantras online so this one sounds a little different um, and the version I know is Nama Samata Vajanam Chana Maharo Shana Spo Taya Hum Chat Ham Mum. So different cadence, different vibe to it. Okay. It means business. Okay. Now I'm going to show you one last one. And uh, so that one was a Chalana or a Chalanatha. And I will put these things in, uh, in, uh, in chat or in the group later. Um, but again, with these practices, so it is important to receive instructions on how to do practices rather than taking up like, oh, Mani Padme Hum is kind of a loose one where that one's kind of the universal one. Like, yeah, go ahead and practice it, no big deal. But um, it's important to, to know what you're doing. So uh, one last one here. Okay. All right. You all can see Ekajati. Okay, now I, I put them in this order because Ekajati out of the out of the three is feels the most wrathful. I don't know why. It was just there's a lot more going on here. So Ekajati is a protector, um, a fierce, powerful goddess, a protector of Nyingma lineage, and and so Jim for Namkai Norbu, who that's the community I practice with. Ekajati is the the practice protector of of the Sogjin teachings, and. Um, Really here, you can just see so many things. So like the giant fang, you know, which represents piercing through obstacles, um, the flame, she, she has a, a, a garland of human skulls. Um, there, she's standing on a corpse, which uh, represents standing on, a, you know, a ego, conquering ego. Uh, snakes, the, actually you'll see a lot of different forms where she's holding different things and, and in different representations and also have some different forms. A lot of times she's blue. Um, but uh, really, if you didn't know anything, I mean, when you look at this, I think a lot of people are just, this is like, can be scary. And it's meant to be, have some energy like that. And, uh, 
and this is totally uh, a part of Tibetan Buddhism. It's a practice you can do, and there's a mantra with that as well. Now, the one that I've used before is actually much shorter. So this particular one I didn't use, but it has a few words that are similar. Um, and uh, it's O Mama Rulu Rulu Hum Jo Hum. I like that it has Mama in there. I think that's great and powerful goddess, O Mama. Uh, and uh, but the one I know where you say a uh, shorter, even a shorter version of this, you're even clapping your hands like Jo Jo, and like you're, I mean, you're clapping and it's like stand up and get to attention and let's get going. So, you know, how intense the practices get, um, you know, it's again, they're not messing around in terms of the embodiment of compassion, that expression of it. So I want to share the spectrum, you know, to open simply to open up the possibilities of what, what are we experiencing um, when we're cultivating compassion, the various forms it can take. Um, and, we're not doing anything with mantras or uh, deity practices, but I think they really, they're really they really wonderful to at least look at and see how sometimes these are represented externally. So overall, going back to this, uh, really is what is compassion? What do we notice when we attune and inhabit compassion and become compassion, okay? And how do we work with difficult emotions that come up or do they serve compassion or do they limit compassion? <laughs> 